Hey everybody, welcome to the latest edition of Off Track with Carruthers and Bice. Uh, we've got a special episode today. Uh, not only are we on video as well as on audio, but I am uh, an American surrounded by three Australians um, who are actually now Americans as well uh, in terms of where they live, but they at least their, their homeland to start with was in Australia. Um, one of them, of course, is my, my co-host, Paul. Hi, Paul. How's it going? How are you? I'm good. We're in Coda. We, yeah, that's right. We're, we're at the Circuit of the Americas for the Motor America Championship of Texas. That's right. Do you know, I don't know if you guys can tell if there's a resemblance these two guys beside each other. They pretty much look like twins here. I'm a good looking one. <laughs> yeah, I can see. I'm um, a moment but, hair. <laughs> but, uh, Not for long. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> so, so we have, of course, Paul's dad, Cal Carruthers, 1969, uh, 250 world champion on a Benelli four-cylinder four-stroke, which is quite a story in itself. And then we have ADR Racing's Aussie Dave, uh, David Anthony, um, who's been, you've been living in this country how many years now? 14 years, I think. Four, 14 years we're going on. 14 yeah. years, wow. So, uh, Paul, you want to kick it off and start? Well, I'm happy to have these guys here. Yeah. And I I'm, I wish I had the accent still. <laughs> Unfortunately, when I was a kid here, that you know, everyone would make fun of me because I had an Australian accent. So I did everything I could to lose it. And now I wish I had it back because these guys sound cooler than I do. Yeah. And I know. I'm always getting, I'll go in the bank or somewhere like that and be some young lady talks to me and said, oh, I love your accent. And I said, love you, 50 years too late. <laughs> <laughs> Who goes in the bank anymore, by the way? I do. <laughs> he actually goes in and gets cash. He's his banker. He doesn't use yeah. an ATM card. He gets cash and he buys stuff with I cash. I buy stuff. I go to the super, Jam sends me up to the supermarket and I, pay for the stuff I buy. And it's like, <laughs> how much you got in your wallet now? And I'm going, oh, not much. <laughs> and um, I'm just one of the old fashioned guys. But you know, the thing is, I, I grew up in Australia. And in Australia, if you didn't have the money to buy it, you didn't buy it. I mean, the only thing you bought was your house and a car. And if you didn't have the money, you saved up the money until you could pay for it. Mm. I mean. We didn't have credit cards and stuff like that. It's kind of the way you run your race team, right? It's like, if you don't have the money, you don't have any probably any credit balances. I don't, I don't, I don't think anybody's gonna give me free tires if I can't pay for them or <laughs> free gas. Here you go, just have it, you're racing. You know, so, you don't have the money. So you guys have a similarity here in that um, you, you both, rate, well, you race, you raced. Um, you do a lot of wrenching on your own bikes. Kel did a lot of wrenching on his own bikes as well as wrenching for other guys. Um, you know, I let talk, Kel, talk about your career and kind of how you started as a racer. And have you always been mechanically inclined and you just kind of worked on your bikes because of necessity or you no, enjoyed my dad it? had a motorcycle shop. Okay. He was Australian sidecar champion after the war, um, numbering and, and state champion like New South Wales. He would have been Australian champion more often, but he had a business, so he didn't go into state too much, you know. But when I was a kid, I mean, I I grew up in a motorcycle shop and um, the Speedway in Sydney at that time was the biggest event in sport, you know, I mean, it was um, sports grounds Friday night, show grounds Saturday night, so I mean, motorcycles were just, mm. I had a motorcycle when I was eight or nine or something like that mm. and I must have annoyed me me mates because I had a motorcycle that I rode. Luckily next to the shop was a fairly open paddock, you know. So I'd ride round and round in that. And so I just, you know, was always in motorcycles. And when I come home from school, I'd fiddle with motorcycles. And my dad let me do all the stuff myself. You know, I mean, to help me, but I mean, you know, when I was 14, I knew how to balance it set of flywheels and all that sort of stuff, you know, so. That's something else we're I got similar with. <laughs> <laughs> I got good, good grounding. And he had me doing pretty much all my own stuff. And when I started racing, believe it or not, my first race bike was like the BSA Bantams and stuff that I raced, you know, when I was 14 and stuff in club events. So it's like a 125 uh, single two one, stroke, right? Yeah, because yeah. that's when 125s first started going. I mean, right. 125s is a big new thing, you know? And then um, I started racing like the, the bigger bikes when I was like 15. And then when I was 16, I got my open competition license like a, two years before I was supposed to have one. 
and um, it just just I, I mean, it, and it was clubman's what they call clubman's racing, and um, so you couldn't race a man's Norton and stuff. And they, they, you had the VSAs and Gold Stars with like the best thing, mm. but I had uh, my first fairly decent bike was uh, it was also my dirt track bike. And then when I went road racing, I had a 350 BSA cast iron B31 engine, and I had a Norton gearbox in it, and I bought a real Royal Enfield frame because they were the only swing arm things wow. you could buy, and I put all that together. And wow! So I did all that myself, you know, when I was a young guy. So it was out of necessity. Right? The bikes yeah, we, weren't very good. We did our own pistons, and when Australia, you like know, cast them. We didn't cast them, but I'd get pistons semi finished from. Guys at home, we'd cut the pockets and I do all wow. my own porting and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. you know. I had a bit more technology when I grew up. I didn't have to make my own pistons. Did you? Yeah. We were talking about it earlier. How much racing did you do in Australia? Yeah, no, not much. Yeah, I mean, it seemed like you've just I mean, been here forever. Yeah, a couple of years. I started yeah. in Australia, did two, maybe three seasons there, and went across to England, raced a year there. Started the following season, and the team I was with fell apart pretty quick. And I come here on a holiday, going back to the, the real world. You know, I thought I was done. And That's a weed. <laughs> back to yeah. Australia, and I already had a job lined up. So I ended up I was just coming here for a couple of weeks, and I never left. I think how rich you'd be if you took that job. Yeah, I know. I, I've always said, if I put all the effort that I put into a road race team, if I put that into a normal career, I'd be, I'd be set. The amount, of, the amount of work it takes to do this just to survive. Yeah, what so. was that career that you would have had if you would have gone to us, back to Australia? Yeah, not a fancy career. It was just back in a bike shop. Mm -hmm. you know, you but asked, related to motorcycles, though. Yeah, you asked, why do you work on your own bikes, etc. Yeah. So I, that's what I've always done. You mm -hmm. know, I grew up I, in Australia, you do an apprenticeship, you're actually a qualified mechanic. Unlike here, where anybody can say they're a mechanic. Right. Yeah, you go through a whole, you know, it's a four year course and you, you become qualified. So that's mm -hmm. what I was. and. Going back to, to work in a bike shop. Mm. We you you're not from Sydney, right? I'm from Melbourne. Okay. He's not a real Australian. <laughs> oh God, here we, we go. Want to get started on this. <laughs> and if you come from Perth, from Perth, you're not even. No, that doesn't count. You're not even <laughs> half white. It's three thousand miles across the Nullarbor Plains or something. I went there once to race. My dad. Bless him. He, they, the first year I had the factory Honda in Australia, they wanted to do the Australian Grand Prix, and it was in a track over in Perth. And it's like, you've got to be kidding me. And so my dad said, okay. So he and a friend went, they, the, the pickup and with the, with the Honda, and the, I used to race a guy's 125 MV as well. And they set off with that. And I mean, it was from Adelaide to Perth, it was mainly a dirt road for like 600 miles or mm. something. And I got on a plane and flew there. I'm going, I'm not going to get drive all because it would Sydney to Perth is like the same as as um, Los Angeles to Miami, you know. Wow, really? You've got to go down more or less to Melbourne and then, oh man, it's just a long way. <laughs> that's, cr that's crazy. Did you, when you, did you race like or ride dirt bikes when you started out in Australia, when you were, I mean, you obviously rode a lot before you started racing, so. Yeah, I was very heavily into into the motocross scene. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of road races from Australia come from the dirt track side, that's pretty big, but I was junior motocross and got to a point where I was hurt a lot, and just got sick of being injured, you know. Mm -hmm. I had enough, I wasn't interested in motorcycles. Mm -hmm. So I stopped riding for about a year, and then, yeah, got the itch to go riding again, and I had a friend that was road racing, yeah, give it a go, see what it's like. What was your first road race? Uh, first road race, I think it was just a little club event. Um, in so Australia? Actually, in Australia, yeah. yeah. But I went out and won that. So as soon as you get that little, wow, I won that, you're on to the, Do you remember before you the, know it, you're out racing the Australian Championship. And, remember what the bike was? It was a RGV 250. Oh, you ran a two stroke. 250 production oh, class. Wow. He's a young guy, aren't he? So you got that with the two strokes with, with Kel too. Was your first race, it was it must have been a two stroke. Two no. stroke. No, no, there's no two. Look, the only two strokes were like little BSA Bantam. Yeah, the Bantam you were talking. I about. raced that, and I was like, I just started. I, I think I'd done one road race on my little my own one twenty five, and then a guy with one of the good Bantam said, "I'd like you to ride mine," and I rode it once at Mount Druitt. 
And then I went to Bathurst and I won the, the, the uh, 350B grade clubman's race. I did one race, they stuck me straight in A grade. Bang. And then also, I don't talk about it too much, but I'm kind of proud of it. I went, I was 16 and I just got my open competition license. And dirt track in my day were like little road races. I mean, my 350 BSA had a Manx Norton close ratio gearbox in it and stuff, you know. <laughs> and I'll never forget it, I was 16 and I went to, it was just outside Sydney, I can't remember the name of the track. And I was, <clears throat> I had my 125 BSA Bantam and I had my 350 BSA and I made my dad's 500 aerial. And um, so I went there, <clears throat> I won the 250, I won the 125 race and I won the 250 race on the 125. And I was a C grade dirt track. So I won the, the C grade 350, I won the C grade 500. I fell off in, I think the B grade 500, but I won the B grade 350. And they put me in the Ace of Scratch race at the end of the event, against all the top guys. And I finished fourth in that. and. And it was like Kel Carruthers 16 wins. I think I rode 14, I won, there was 14 races and I won 11 of them. Really? And then wow. they put me straight in A grade. I went from C grade to A grade and they just screwed me right. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're an A grader and you ain't quite as good as you thought you were. <laughs> but yeah, it was, what, me, what, it was my first dirt track race. What, what is it about you that hey, you, had, you have a knack for racing? What, what is the, I think, I think I discovered that real early on when I was just a kid. Because mm -hmm. we'd go to different places and I kind of instinctively knew what the right line was and stuff, mm. you know? And I mean, I wasn't fast, but I knew where to go and how to do it and everything. And I just got, you know, you get better as you go along. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's I mean that's the first thing for road racing is just being, pick the lines. I mean, especially when to, you go to Europe and you got, those big long road circuits. I mean, you're thinking, you take like the Isle of Man, for example, you've got to break it down into sections. And like in Spa in Belgium and that, you know, you're thinking four corners ahead because you got this wind, really windy, flat out, almost flat out section. And then when you get the end of it, there's like a hundred mile an hour left hand corner and you better be on the right hand side of the road, not in the middle of the road. Right. Or you're going to either die or you're going to back it off and lose, you know, 100 yards just mm -hmm. like that. So mm -hmm. it's just, um, it used to be when I raced, especially in Europe on the big circuits, it was all lines, you know, just visualizing how you had to do it all. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of come natural to me, I guess. Yeah, a lot of natural talent involved there. Yeah, it's just that second generation. generation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, David? I mean, are you when when you started to race, did you just you know have feel like you had a knack for it, and did you understand what you were doing, and you know? Yeah, I guess because I started from a young age on the dirt bike, racing was you know all I did every weekend. So right. So it was always it always come pretty natural. But yeah. By the time I got on a road bike, you know, it wasn't even a thought. It's just it's just what you do. Mm -hmm. At the time, you know, through growing up. I wanted to be motocross champion. That's where I was, you know, that's where my goals and aspirations were. Yeah. But that didn't pan out. And yeah, then the, the road bike thing was just going to be a bit of fun. You know, I never thought I would, you know, realistically, I knew how expensive and hard it was to get into the sport. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really enjoyed it and just worked hard and made it happen. I actually got a really good job right at the time I started racing. And that's that's what, without that position, I wouldn't have been able to, able to do it. Mm. Definitely, uh, you know, you see it now. So many people want to want to go racing, and it's even harder now because of the cost. Right. Back then, it, you know, it wasn't cheap, but it was, right. you could you could make it happen. Mm. Did you race with any of the Goberts, like motocross uh, or anything? Not really. So they pretty much stopped racing motocross when I was sort of starting. Yeah, they were well into their. I was racing motocross when they were well into their into yeah. their road racing. Because they were Anthony was a good motocrosser, I think as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess Anthony carried on for a while. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean there was 
times when we did race together, we're certainly on the track together at some times. But. And then when I got to a sort of national level in Australia, that's when Alex was still racing and Aaron, Aaron made, I made a one season on 250 production against Aaron and then he left. So yeah, I've raced them both on the road and on the dirt. Mm. How did you, when you came, when you came to America, how did you end up like North San Diego, Marietta area? I mean, how did, uh, Oh, well, how long does this go for? You want a story? <laughs> <laughs> so I come here, as I said earlier, I come here on a holiday. I was with a friend. That friend, some of you guys may remember, his name was Brent George. He rode for the Corona Honda. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. A long, it was Corona Suzuki, sorry, back then. Right. That would have been 2005. So he rode that season and he didn't get another ride. So he come to England with me to try and get a ride. That's when my team fell through and he had a lot of friends here and he had organized a bike to do some club racing on and try and chase some contingency. And, you know, all right, I'll, I'll come for a couple of weeks and check it out and help you out. And, you know, I did have hope that maybe he'd make some money and I could stay and kind of be his mechanic. But we actually he had a friend and got a job driving a car across the country. And he knew my wife, well, my current wife now, he'd known her from, she used to work for Yamaha and he just met her at the track. And we needed a car picked up in California and brought to Vegas, and we were heading from the East Coast to Vegas. And so we started calling people, and just so happened, she's like, yeah, I'll, I'll go to Vegas. It was Vegas Supercross. And she was working anyway, she needed to get there. Oh, well, I'll drive a car, I get paid. And so we met up with her there, and I guess we hit it off, and- I was gonna say, did you steal, did you steal this since. girlfriend? Is that uh, pretty much what happened there? Oh, I don't know. You'd have to ask them. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to know the answer. <laughs> Doesn't want to know the good stuff. <laughs> but yeah, I guess I was, uh, I guess for some reason she really liked me. And, you know, a few weeks down the road, she was at a time where she wanted to do something different, you know, just working and finish school and everything. And, you know, I said, well, I think I can go and win some club races. And lucky for me, she said, all right, let's do it. She bought the bike and, Bought a, bought a motor home and off we oh, went. Wow. You picked a good one then. Yeah, yeah you did. Yeah. No, she funded the lot and obviously we went went racing and won some club races and earned that back real quick. And it was, those were the good old days where you could do that and make some good money just chasing club and, money. And, and you still, I mean, I know it's mostly for testing for, for Moto America, but you still do some club racing in the off season. Yeah, I was actually uh, working it out the other day. I've actually made a pretty good income so far just doing club racing with contingencies and tire money and stuff like that it's you know it is for me because i've been doing it for so long and people can't understand this but riding a bike is you know it's work yeah, you, don't quite, yeah. you don't quite often look forward to well let's go ride the bike that'll be fun right. i do enjoy the racing side the competitive side that that is still fun but yeah you're going to do club races where you don't really have much competition and you're not really testing anything so you're just circulating it's a job but it's a better job than sitting in an office nine to five. Or, right. so I'm not Race, complaining. Racing was the best job I ever had. Yeah. yeah. Luckily, yeah. Got, I mean, God, when I was just really young, I, I got smart and married my wife like 50, what, 51 years ago or <laughs> something. me a lot that he did that. But yeah, I was going to say, uh, it's a pretty important point. Yeah, so how would be know, less crowded? <laughs> you know, I got lucky that I married the right woman that backed me up all my career and everything. That's awesome. So, so but, and I used to ride motocross too. In fact, when I was like, you know, pretty much the top road racer in Australia, I still did some motocross stuff just for fun. We called them scrambles more yeah. than, uh, at Moore Bank and that. And they had a the first motocross they ever televised in Australia. I went won the damn thing. And like, I just used to do it for fun. And like, they, they, talks nowadays of guys got a vintage motocross bike, you know, the wheels out of greaves or something. I mean, I had a 350 BSA with a cast iron engine and everything, and they had this much suspension travel. And, <laughs> and I go, yeah, that's a real vintage motocross yeah. bike. Yeah. But we had fun. One of the guys I used to race all the time was Jimmy Airy. And he was for a long time, the top speedway rider. Oh, okay. And I was the top road race guy and he was the top Speedway guy, and we go do all this dirt track stuff for just for fun, and uh, yeah, you know, Jimmy here I still. Do you race? Do you race Speedway? No, my dad was. Uh, I, uh, you know, when I think about it, maybe I should have, because you could make. My dad made good money 
mm-hmm. racing speedway back yeah. then. It wasn't like comparatively speaking. Right. Did you ever race speedway? No, I've never done it. No, you ever been no. around it? No, not at all. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's pretty big in Australia and right. in Europe. It's not that big here, but we yeah. have the you know, flat track, which is somewhat similar a little bit. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. Speedway in Sydney was a big deal. Yeah. Friday night, Saturday night. That's why I was asking. They I figured, yeah. Big crowds and everything. That's cool. Yeah. So one of the things I want to know is, so Kel, you raced, always wrenched, tuned, did that. There came a point in your career where you stepped away from the racing, you worked with Kenny, and I want to ask you when that transition happened and how it did. And then I want to ask David, you haven't gotten to that point. Have you projected <clears throat> forward to think about that? So let me start, Kel, with, with you, how that, that transition happened. Well, I, we did the European stuff. I only did that for five years, which is because I went to Europe. I mean, I was old, you know, 28 or something when I went to Europe. So I only did five years. And we were going to do one year in America. And I had a good year. And then I signed a contract with Yamaha. And part of my deal was look after Kenny Roberts, help him as much as I could, look after his bikes and teach him as much as I could. And then the next year, Yamaha wanted me to actually have an American road race team. And they supply the riders and the bikes and I supplied the workshop and all that stuff. And I did one more year and then eventually they just said, we don't want you to ride anymore. What was the reason for that? Well, they had, uh, the whole, their whole road race effort in America was like centered around me. And last year I raced, I didn't race that. Sometimes I'd race and sometimes I didn't. I, mean, I, had, a, I had a good year, I got second in Daytona and run one Talladega. Mm-hmm. And I did all the testing, of, or not the final testing of the TZ700 in Japan. And then that year, a couple of races, my bikes were in the truck and I didn't even bother riding. I was just so busy. Yeah. And but you didn't want to stop racing though, did you? Yeah, I did. I, was, I just kind of lost the interest. It was, okay. I, I mean, Daytona, I got second in Daytona and Saren and won it on my spare bike. Half an hour before the race, I wasn't going to ride. I mean, I'd been up nearly all night. I had my own three riders and so on, so there was four, four riders. Wow. And we had all the ref. I mean, in the morning, I was helping them set up the refuel equipment and everything. And I just said to Jan, I'm Jan, I'm beat, you know. And she said, well, just go out there and, you know, if you feel all right, just keep going. So I went out there and I ran around and I look at the thing and I'm, I'm fourth and then I'm third and then I'm second. And, <laughs> And I just rode around and ended up second in the thing. And, and I was, in, in the in the end, um, the next year we had the 700s and we tested, we got number two and number three, engine number ones. We went to Daytona and Kenny was good on it and Romero and Castro didn't, they didn't have a good feel for it. And so I went out and I did like five laps on it and I was fairly close to Kenny because at Daytona, if you hold it wide open around the oval and down the straight and slow around the corners, you're still doing all right. Right. And I stopped and Pete Schick was the team manager. He said, get off it and you're not ever getting back on it again. Really? It's like, wow. You know. That's kind of harsh. Well, for me, it was kind of a relief actually. Yeah. You know, yeah. Someone else telling you to stop. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, somebody made me stop, basically. Right. And it wasn't my wife told me I had to stop or anything. It was like a straight out business thing sort of thing. Yeah. And they just said, you know, forget it. So David, you have other riders on your team, but you had a great weekend at Road Atlanta last weekend. I mean, you, you were you pretty happy with that? Yeah, I mean, you gotta be happy. Yeah. As, you know, as a couple of interviews I've done as a racer, you're never happy because those, you know, I finished fifth, but the fourth place was, you know, they're all kind of together at the lead. Right. But it was still a pretty big gap, so. Yeah. You know, they, they definitely pulled away from us, but I am, you know, the position was a lot better than what I have been in the last couple of years. Yeah. You know, you're asking about, you know, when it's time to change over and step away. For me, I've been doing it a long time, but the thoughts come and gone here and there, but I've always known deep down that I'm not, I, for whatever reason, I don't get to show my true potential, mm-hmm. whether it's the bike, the program, whatever's going on that year, lack of budget. So that's what keeps me going is the, the thought that I, I believe in myself and I know I can I can prove it to, to people if everything goes right. So mm-hmm. That's the main thing that keeps you going. And to 
to start to see some progress, yeah, it's it's a rewarding weekend. Yeah. But to, uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess I'll finish on that. It's it's just rewarding all the effort you put in to, to get there, and that's what keeps me going. Well, so have you? Has it ever entered into your mind down the road? You know, I mean, like I said, you had a great weekend last weekend, so maybe that thought. But yet, have you ever thought, like, I don't know, ten years from now, are you going to be managing a team and? I'm pretty sure that I'll be managing a team. I've done it for a long time. I've had a few seasons here and there where I've gone and rode for, for other teams. And I mean, now I'm at an age where if I'm gonna keep riding, it's gonna be on my team. No one's gonna give me a ride. Right. But I've said for probably five years now, as soon as I can afford a rider that's better than me, I'm happy to step away. Really? But yeah, anybody that's ahead of me is earning a lot more money than I am. So <laughs> till this stage, I'm gonna keep riding. Right, yeah. Is there some- Oh, okay. Go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, is there anything different about your bike this year? I mean, what do you think about how things went at Road Atlanta? No, that's what everybody's been asking. What's okay. different? Great. Uh, the program itself is exactly the same. Yeah. It's just me. You know, different wow. mindset. Uh, I put on a lot of weight last year. I'm still showing a little bit, but <laughs> yeah, you do you do look thinner through the face. But though. I've been working hard to, to wow. lose that weight and get fit. And normally it's you know just crazy hours getting ready. Right. This year I left pretty much everything the same, so there wasn't a too much prep work yeah you know, we weren't restructuring so i was able to focus on myself a lot more and you know i'm gonna go to bed I'm gonna do a normal day's work which normally never happens in this industry right so i focused on you know i work nine to five and if the work's not finished it doesn't matter i'm gonna my day's done and it made a difference in yeah, the results and, so. and including in that day is is my exercise right you know last couple of years i haven't done any kind of training nothing mm. that's where this year i really tried to step it up and you know, I don't think, I've always been relatively fit. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's it. It's more a, a mindset knowing that you're prepared. Right. It's probably more the, more the key this year, just believing, really. Right. Yeah. Well, hang on. I got a question. I'm a bit disappointed in you, Sean. Oh, okay. Oh. So oh. every every podcast I've listened to, oh. it appears as though you've spent hours on Google. <laughs> yeah, okay, finding, I got one. <laughs> finding a fact about wherever they're from right. in the country. I'm so, ready. So let's hear some of some crazy facts. I right? wanted to start that way, actually. <laughs> I we he asked me some really ridiculous stuff. A I, while ago. I did. Oh, God. I did. But were you were you born in Australia? You were yes. right, yes. and you were there till how old were you? Five. Okay, so you maybe I don't know what what age the Australians take their walkabout, but you might have missed it. Did you do a walkabout? Hell no. What's did you do one? Um, what's a walkabout? I, I thought Australia. You've been watching Crocodile Dundee. Yeah, but you go out in the. You go out and you visit the Aborigines. You don't do, you know, you go to Perth or whatever you have to do. I don't know. You need to get back on Google. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. We talked about, did you ever wear that hat that has the cork sign? Yeah. Okay. Well, no. You never wore that hat? <laughs> the, the, it's not bad now, but was, this was the Australian salute. But we used to have flies in Australia like you wouldn't believe. That's why they wore those hats with the cork. It's, now it's like, it's good there now. I mean, they don't have it. But yeah. I can remember... You probably don't know Jack O'Hearn. I mean, he was one of the top Australian riders. And he used to tell him, no, don't go to Australia. There's nothing but flies there, you know. <laughs> you know, he didn't want any of these English guys coming and living in Australia or all that stuff. Just leave it to us guys. <laughs> yeah, so. No, but I didn't have to wear my hat with corks on it. Does the water actually go the other direction down the drain? You know, I keep every time I go back home, I've got to check that out. I got to look forget, at it. Right? Forget it every time. I've got I don't too. know. It does. It, know it, it does. It has to. It, I don't understand why it's like under. It's, it's down uh, under, I guess. Right. It sucks well, right down too. It it's some, it's, it's something to do about the spinning <laughs> thing, the gravitational pull of your yeah. urine. Well, <laughs> yeah. We're walking upside down down there. there. <laughs> so. Kel, you, you were inducted a couple of years ago into the Australia, what is it, uh, Sports Hall of Fame? I was professional? inducted into, I was one of the first 30 into the Australian Sports Hall of Fame. Wow. That was 1985, I think. And I was the only motorcycle rider in it. And for years, I was the only motorcycle rider in it. Now there's only four of us in it, anyhow. A couple of guys you probably know, Gardner and... Doing, 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 and right? Stoner, yeah. Okay. I mean, there's four of us. Right. That's it. And then three years ago, they started the Australian Motorsports Hall of Fame, and they had me go out there, and I was one of the original thirty in that. So, 
I mean, in the two Australian ones. And the Australian Sports Hall of Fame, that's really a neat thing. I mean, it's, mm. you know, I've got my certificates and um, to the annual year I got a, a certificate from the Queen of England and stuff, you know. I mean, wow. it's some pretty neat that's stuff, great. you know. And it, in Australia, the Sports Hall of Fame is, is a big deal. They've got a nice museum down in Melbourne. <laughs> under the under the Melbourne cricket ground, and I went and looked at it while I was out there, and it's pretty. Nice. It's nice to go and see your name up, you know, yeah. on the wall and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Do you, Do you get back home? Do you go back to Australia very often? Normally, it works out to be once every couple of years. We'll wow. Go back for three or four weeks. <clears throat> and you have family back there? Yeah, mum and dad are back there, but they they tend to come out here more than okay more than we go back. And I do have a brother, but. Yeah, don't really, don't really speak to him much. Really? How many years apart are you guys? We're only one year apart. Oh, really? Yeah. And he's probably not a racer, not into motorcycles at all? He's or? actually, I don't know when it was, last year, uh, world jet ski freestyle champion. Oh, oh really? really? Oh, wow, that's, that's cool. That's yeah. Paul's sport. Paul. Wow. <laughs> It is boring too. He ended up working on those. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, okay. he worked for the I CD did, factory uh, team. I did the CD factory stuff. Really? It was kind of neat because, I mean, but I, I, been my own rider and all, and then I had the team and the riders come in and we didn't have computers and all that stuff, you know. And the rider had come in and kill it's no good. What's wrong with it? I don't know. <laughs> so you'd have to figure out what was wrong with the bikes and do all this stuff. With the watercraft, I used to do all the testing. We had, we had, uh, they rented this lake every Monday, and where I did it all, um, we had dinos and everything, and I'd mechanics and stuff and I'd go and I'd do all the testing and everything and then you'd go to a race and the guy would come in and say Kel it's not very good or something I'd you'd get on it just go ride the thing <laughs> you know come back and so you come yeah there's nothing wrong with it it's fine or whatever it is so I mean it was kind of a different world it was kind of fun and then the motor the watercraft the racing thing just yeah took a nose dive but so here's a random question about <laughs> Googling. Go. <laughs> this could be it. Is it <laughs> actually true? So people with reddish red hair freckles in this country, we tend to call them gingers. Do you guys actually call them blues? Nope, never no. heard that ever. You haven't ever heard that? <laughs> yeah, you guys come up with a crazy story. I read Don't that. Don't bring yeah. me into this. Jeez. And how about, well, okay, What the other one is, of course, a girl is a Shirley, of course. Is Sheila. That? Sheila. Oh, Sheila. 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 God. I screwed that up. All right. Jeez. But you don't call... You've got to go to your local outback to see that. You don't, you don't call, you don't call red hair, red hair no, people blues. I, that's so many times. And what's that. really neat in Australia, <laughs> and this might be one of my problems, because I can't remember people's names. I mean, I just do not remember... I don't, I mean, I don't know my own telephone number. I don't know the <laughs> license plate on the car. I just don't remember all that stuff. But in Australia, it's either mate or love. How you going, mate? How you going, love? Mm. That's it. You know, you don't have to know their name or anything. <laughs> but we don't That's call the men and women. We, right. Yeah. Sean. We, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Don't mess it up there? when you go. <laughs> we, yeah, that could be trouble for we me. We know they're shielders, but nobody ever, God, I haven't heard that for years. I mean, I go, I don't go back now much anymore and, but I used to go back with the race team and stuff. Right. I used to test it. And I'd go back and I'd get guys like Jeffrey Sale and that, and they'd come out with those things and I'd go, oh my God, you know, the sayings they have and everything is unreal. <laughs> my mom has all those sayings. Does oh, she? Yeah. Like she, she, uh, she, the Sheila reminds me she, when somebody, when somebody doesn't shower much, she, she always says, well, they think hygiene's a tall, tall Sheila. Tall Sheila, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hygiene, tall <laughs> Sheila, yeah. So my mom says more of that stuff than he does. <laughs> yeah, she's, got all, she's got all those things. Some of the things they say, I mean, you can get, I mean, they even on, on the internet sometimes, you'll see a list of Australian sayings in your ring. I mean, they're hilarious, some of the things. Never they even say. heard them, yeah. God, uh, well, that was back, I mean, this is a bit before your time, mate, so. Well, <laughs> do they think back home that you're, do they think you've lost any of your accent from being over here for as long as you have? Yeah, so everybody here tells me, I sound very Australian. Very. Yeah. But yeah, as soon as anyone from Australia speaks to me, oh, you sound like an American now. Yeah, oh I no. I don't know how you get that, but <laughs> you know, I've never, you know, Paul talked about yeah. trying to lose his accent because wanted to fit in. Right. You know, I've never tried at all to lose it, but you definitely try to speak clearer so people can understand you. Yeah. You know, I was never able to go for through a drive-through for the first four oh, yes. years of living here because 
Oh, I know. Yeah, I'm sure that right yeah. He can't, if he, he goes, he, he drinks Diet Coke. And when he says, no matter what, the waitress never understands what he's talking about when he says a Diet <laughs> Coke. And then when I go home, they're so proud of me that I still got an Australian accent. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Like, but you, it's yours really has new. changed, though, right? Your head to, had to have changed a little, hasn't it? I suppose. I mean, I don't think I have an accent anymore, but I guess I do. Oh, you, you do. Know? Yours, yours <laughs> is stronger than David's, but... And, and Paul's is the least of all of you, but yeah, you know, they, it being that he's Aussie Dave, he's got to continue to be have yeah. an Australian accent. He's not Aussie Paul at all, so <laughs> he, he doesn't. You know, you don't have to tell that, and we don't need to tell that you're Aussie Kel because you're this 1969 world champion. Oh, yeah. So that's that was, that was you know, that's 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem that long, does it? Though, does it seem like it was that long ago? No, I guess it doesn't, but. You know, it's, you remember things from the past. You forget a lot of things. I mean, people ask me stuff and I'm going, you know, that was 50 years ago, or that was 60 years ago, or that was 65 years ago. And you, you kind of remember a lot of it. And of course, I remember that particular period of my life. Mm -hmm. And but I mean, there's, I mean, there's so many people I've met in racing and there's so many things I've done and so many places I'm, I've been and everything, and it's like kind of really so neat. But you get Jan remembers a lot more. Jan remembers she got a memory like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. You know, I and mean, she can pick up a phone number and she has dialed for ten years and just dials it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you, you know, you remember a lot of stuff, but the other stuff just, I mean, I won the, the that race I was talking about. I won at Bathurst. I have absolutely no recollection of that race. Mm. We went back a few years ago and they had a big dinner for me. And they asked, it was good because it was a question thing, you know, and they asked me about that race and I said, hey, I know I won that race. I have absolutely no recollection of it. And it was such a big deal for a 16-year-old kid to go and win at yeah. Bathurst. I mean, Bathurst is a big deal in Australia. And I, God, I don't even remember. I don't remember it. That's when lying would have been good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, tell me if you lie, you've got to have a good memory too, because you've got to be able to tell the same lie in a year's time. No, so no. you've got to, it's better to be truthful all the time. And just say, I don't remember. Now, Paul, he was saying Bathurst, I think, was it? Bathurst. Bathurst. Is it B-A-T-H-H-U-R-S-T, Bathurst? The Melbourneites say Bathurst. Okay. Yeah, they used to. Sounds the same. Unless he says it, then it sounds totally wrong. We had Bathurst, and they had Phillip Island. Yeah. Well, Phillip Island now, it amuses me. I wrote a preface of an Australian book. That's all a about preface. Preface, I was preface, going to say, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and I wrote the foreword for it. And I said, it's ironic. It's like I was used to the Grand Prix circuits and stuff. And then now Phillip Island is almost the most popular track on the circuit, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And for us, Phillip Island was a short circuit. Wow. I mean, that was just a short circuit. It was a really neat short circuit. Yeah. But now it's like one of the top tracks because yeah, all is. these little Mickey Mouse race tracks and stuff <laughs> that race on there. But don't get them started. On yeah. That, uh, well, I don't bring up what, nine, nine miles, right? right? Oh, no. What was the race you said? It was a nine mile race and it was like 10 laps. Um, well, miles? I mean, the Man is 37 miles oh, around. The okay. Nürburgring Ring was 14 miles. Wow. I think Spa was nine miles or something like that. Okay. Dunrod is eight miles. Yeah, they're that's all, the one you were talking about. They were all long. Right. Can you race at Nürburgring Ring when it was long? Wow. Yeah, last, the first year you was there. Because we and, went there early and you rode a street bike to try to learn it. Okay. And like um, Bruno, they got a new circuit there. Well, we knew it's fairly old now. But I go back there and they talk about, you know, the old Bruno circuit. And I'm going, no, no, that's the short old Bruno. So that one's only like six miles round. The other one was like, you know, close to 10 or something like that. Right. But like they were all 100 mile races. It's incredible. Stuff. Yeah. And it, you did it. I mean, you're talking about exercise. I never had to exercise. I raced every week. Right. I mean, you just. You went from one race to another, and it's totally, I mean, it's kind of interesting that, you know, I talk to people and they ask about it. I mean, when I went to Europe, my first year was difficult because you've got to learn these tracks and the guys have been there before you and they won't tell you what gearing you want or anything. I mean, you're just another guy that's going to come and race them. Right. But we used to get 
beginning of the year, we'd get this uh, motorcycle paper, and the middle page was all the FIM road race, sanctioned road race for the whole year. And you would sit down, I'd have Jan and I'd be working on it, and we'd write to the first half of the season. And you were actually asking for a start and how much money they'd pay you to go. Because wow. the prime money was virtually nothing. It was all start money. Right. Of course, there's no, no internet or anything like that. It was all, you'd write letters. You'd, right. And you'd have your letterhead and all that, and you'd ask if you, you know, which you I'd wanted to start. And I had three bikes. I'd try and get three three classes if I could. I always get two. That's a but, little bit like you with club racing, though. I mean, try to make some money. And you would, yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. you would negotiate. And I was pretty well organized because I had a woman in England handle my mail. So all my mail went to her. And then Tuesday morning, she put the motorcycle paper in and sent it off to the next racetrack because I'd be at another racetrack <laughs> on Thursday. And my mail would show up. And I'd have all my correspondence, and if it was really important, she'd send me a telegram to the thing, because, you know, an organiser would come at the last minute. And you would write to, sometimes you'd be writing to three different racetracks in Europe at the same, for the same weekend, and you'd be just negotiating. So every week, you were racing, you worked for a different boss, you got a different pay scale. Wow. You know, one week you're getting 400 pound start money, the next week you're getting 300 pound, and, and, that, and then the, when you get on the further, then you start right into the second half. And I mean, we raced, we were racing virtually every weekend. Wow. All that and he doesn't text me back. And yeah, you were there. <laughs> so we do all this and it was a whole, I mean, it was a different world, you know. Yeah. Different world. All right, so we're probably almost done here. I gotta ask, have you, do you ever fancy yourself a bit of Vegemite from that time to time? <laughs> uh, I just don't. Do oh, you yeah. really? Kind of yeah, smelling. Vegemite, you just put a little baby, little baby, not a layer. I mean, just a, a little bit on it. Because they it. think it's like putting jelly or something and they slap it on and it's really bad. Isn't it really salty or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. put it on just just barely a whisper on it. You like it? Yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, it's good. But he doesn't yeah. eat it at home. Oh, Wait, you, you ever, ever have it, Paul? You like it's it? Not, no. <laughs> I wouldn't even be your friend if you liked it. Because we tried it. Wrong. I like salty the stuff. The good like to try it. Well, I'll bring <laughs> you some it's, it's it. It's black. It's black and it's, it's black. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah it's, it's yucky stuff, I guess. It's like tar. Yeah. <laughs> salty I'm tar. Never, yeah, I have my favorite things. Tar and salt. You might like it. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, they have good candies and everything. They have minties and all that good uh, stuff. Oh, that's right. They do have good candy. They have yeah. good candy and everything. You miss that? I like the yeah. violet crumble bars. I watched well, that man yeah, the corner nodding at the candy going, yeah. <laughs> I can remember when I was a kid, the, my dad, my one of my best friends, his dad had a milk bar. And he let us know when the violet crumble bars were coming in. Of course, it was... <laughs> They weren't on all the time. They were pretty scarce, you know. Wow. While the crumble bar showed up, it was like, oh, it was a big deal. What's a milk bar? Is it like an ice cream shop? Yeah. I was, yeah, I was waiting bar. for that. I could see you yeah. taking like, milk bar. Yeah. You went and sit and have milk? I mean, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> like you get shakes and stuff. Oh, it's like Dairy Queen, you know, Australia. Shakes with candies and stuff. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't even say that. When I was growing up, a milk bar is like the corner store. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah okay. true. Your bread, you milk, get a meat bread, pie there, too. Oh, yeah. so... You would go, like, people still buy milk in a convenience store. Is that why it was right. called it's a milk like a bar? 7-Eleven, you know. Okay. It's your local home, you know. Okay, so it's not an ice cream shop. It's No. no. Where you in my day, it was and... more just a milk bar. It was more milkshakes and stuff like oh. that. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, you didn't get groceries or anything like that then. And Vegemite, of course. <laughs> no, got that at the grocery <laughs> store. Okay. Hey, we're back at gro talking about grocery stores, Paul. Yeah, you're favorite. <laughs> uh -huh. So, anyway. Well, let's wrap it up. Yeah, it was good. I think we've worn everybody out, and they know too much about Australia now. Yeah. Melbourne and Sydney. And he's still confused. I yeah, he, oh, I've got He more. will be confused. He'll ask me the same questions all weekend. I'll have follow-up questions for we'll sure. We'll have to get him the Vegemite, though. Yeah, oh, gee. We'll yeah. Him some. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. everybody, thank you for joining us, and you guys, thanks for coming in. Thank you, yeah. Dave, good luck this weekend. And yeah, uh, good luck tomorrow. Get thank you. closer to those Sunday. guys. And yeah, well, now I've you know had that top five. Now the pressure's on to... Stay with him. That's right. Be the next bike after those big factory ones. That's stay right. on it. So, yeah, stay stay on, on it. It's pretty important. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, those of us that uh, listen to the podcast continue to do so. And uh, also, don't forget our Moto America Live Plus, where you can watch all this. 
the weekends racing as well as uh, Fox Sports 2 and, and down the road there, NBC Sports. So thank you, Sean. Thank again. you, Paul. And uh, thanks, guys. Thank thanks. you, guys. Yeah.